Shower eyes up and so pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of calling upon you. Thank you for this day of worship. A day, your presence is more than, is greater than thousand days outside there in the world. And Lord, we thank you for the joy of fellowship together. For the joy of coming to be in your presence today so we can hear from my Heavenly Father. Lord, we pray that your word today will reach out to every heart present in Jesus' name. And what you reveal to us, you grant us the grace, the spirit and the mind, the desire, the decision to follow through and to be obedient to your word in Jesus' name. Help us to be doers of the word. Not hear us only deceiving, deluding, a very self. But Lord, that will wake up and you stir us up to be doers of your word in Jesus' name. And the blessing of obedience you will grant to every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You can sit down. As we come together today. We're looking at God himself. God that gives us the passion for him. The passion, the pursuit to reach out to the almighty God and then to reach out to the people around us. That is the compassion we have for people. I'm talking to you today on this message, passion for God and compassion for the world. Passion for God and compassion for the world. We're looking at uh, Second Corinthians chapter five. In Second Corinthians chapter five, I'm reading to you from verse fourteen. Here it says, "For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that He died, then we are all dead, and that He died for all." That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but to him which died for them. Rule again. Here we have what the Lord Himself is telling us about what Christ has done. And the consequence of that which the Lord has in verse 14 it says, For the love of Christ constraineth us. To seek the love of Christ for you. And as to think about did on the cross of Calvary, how he died, the agony, the suffering, the pain, the humiliation that came upon him. And then he says, that love, secret love, now constrains us. That what means it now compels us. That what means it now makes us to say, if God has done that for me, if Christ has done that for me, if Calvary has given me what I have, what should be my response when you think about that love you meditate on that love it constrains you compels you it moves you to want to do something for the kingdom of god and therefore others to know for others to see for others to have what you have for the love of christ constraineth us because with those judge with those estimate evaluate and now we can decide that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And then in verse 15, and that he died for all. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. That is, that Christ has died for you. That now it brings you to the realization. You're not living for yourself anymore. And you're not thinking about yourself anymore. You're thinking about the one that died for you, but unto him which died for them. That rose again. But 17, therefore. Therefore. Because of what he did. Therefore. Because of Calvary. Therefore. Because of his agony. Because of bearing your pain, your punishment, and the peril of what you have done. Because of bearing the judgment of your sin. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. It says, therefore, look at Calvary and see the power of the blood of the Lamb and see the power of the cross of Christ and then understand reason with yourself. If you are to remain the same as your word, what's, what's the importance of Calvary? If, if the power of the blood of Christ is not able to make a change 
more different, greater than the change of the old covenant. What's the use if the power coming from the Calvary, coming from Calvary, from the cross of Jesus Christ, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Look at some people in the Old Testament, those who are redeemed by the blood of animals. Enoch, walking with God. If what Christ is doing today is not greater than what it was done, than what was done for Enoch, what's the use? And then he tells us that look at people like Samuel, people like Daniel, and people like Moses, and all those people of the Old Testament. And he, those people that were changed and transformed and turned around by the blood of the Lamb, that he is the animal. And if you are not able to have a greater conversion, a greater transformation, transformation, a greater change of life and change of character today, what will be the use of Christ going to Calvary? That's why it says, therefore, because of what Christ has done, that's why it says, therefore, because of the agony of the Lord Jesus Christ and the punishment that he bought you, the blood is shed for you. Therefore, if any man be in Christ... Any man in the first generation, in the first century, any man in this final century, if any man in the first church who first had the gospel in Jerusalem, and if any man in this church, any man, any time, in any age, in any period, if any man be in Christ, that's the secret. If any man be in Christ, anybody can tell you he's in Christ. How do you know they are really in Christ? Anyone can stand up and give testimony in church. I mean, Christ, how do you know the testimony is true? Anybody can say, come on, I know the Lord, I'm now in Christ. How do you know they're telling us what heaven will affirm? It says, maybe he'll be a new creature. He'll not be an old rascal. He'll not be an old carnal or unrighteous fellow. He'll not be an old stealing, a stealing fellow. The fellow that is still doing evil, if any man be in Christ, any man young or old, any man illiterate or educated, any man any time because of the power of the blood of Jesus that never fails. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. It says all things have passed away. And behold, what does it say next? Not some things, everything in your life. Your thoughts, your imagination, your habits, your lifestyle, your character, your conduct, your relationship, your interaction. Everything that you have been doing, everything turns around. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And then he tells us the consequence of that. Remember, number one, Christ suffered for you, revealing, showing his love. Number two, now you have come into Christ, so become a new creature in Christ. Now, number three, the consequence of that, the love you receive, you want to give out. The benefit you have got, you want to reach out to other people. It says then in verse 18, it tells us in that verse 18, it tells us what now becomes of us and all things of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. It said, number one, you've got redemption. And you are reconciled unto God. And then now, because of that redemption and reconciliation which you've got yourself, now you have the ministry of reconciliation. A ministry of reconciliation. What kind of ministry is that? Have you ever seen a, a, sometimes in a family that a child is gone astray? And the father of that child says, stay outside there, don't come back here. And then somebody wants to reconcile, wants to bring that child into the family. And then he pleads with the child and he pleads with the father. And the father eventually said, all right, if the child comes, uh, I'll accept him. And then the child is still outside. And the child is saying, since daddy said I should not come home, I'm not going home. And then you go to plead with the child. You plead with God. God in prayer and you plead with the sinner in preaching 
And then you bring this man, this young child that said, I'll never come back home. You bring him back to the father. And then he now states, so what have you done? You reconciled the father and the child. You're reconciling the creator and the creatures. And the people that have gone astray, the people that are living in their sin, you're reconciling them unto the Lord. You're praying, you're making intercession for them unto God. Oh, that they will be saved. Oh God, these people have sinned a great sin, but Lord, forgive them. If not, blot out my name out of the book which you have written. And then you go to the sinners to say, you have committed a great sin. Turn, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me here. That's Moses talking to God in prayer and talking to the people in his preaching. That's the Almighty God and then sending us out and is saying, He has given us a ministry of reconciliation. You are talking to the Almighty God, making intercession for them that they will turn, that the Lord will grant them repentance unto salvation. And then you are talking to the people, don't remain in your sin. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Then in verse 19, to we, that is to say that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. What makes the ministry is the word is the word is given unto us in verse 18 the ministry of reconciliation and then in verse 19 the word of reconciliation without the word there is no ministry is the word that makes the ministry and the word of reconciliation is telling them be ye reconciled unto god Come back to God. You are far away from the Lord. Repent and turn and believe and come to the Lord. And then in verse 20, now then, we ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled unto God. That's what we're looking at today on the one hand, passion for God. On the other hand, compassion for the world. Passion for God and compassion for the world. The Lord is telling us that now that we're in the kingdom, do something for the kingdom. Now that we're children of God, do something to make people turn away from their own will and from the will of the world and turn to the will of the Almighty God. Passion for God. The pursuit of God, the desire, the affection for God, the love for God, the love that Christ manifested. You are so grateful you are born again. You want to do something for the kingdom. You are so grateful you know the Lord. You are so grateful that the Lord himself has brought you into the kingdom at such a time as this. And you want to say, I'm going to contribute something positive into the kingdom of God. Passion for God. And then that passion for God will lead you to want to minister to his creatures. Will lead you to want to say to the people, don't perish in your sins. Be ye reconciled unto God. Compassion for the world. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, self-sacrificing passion for God. Self-sacrificing passion for God. That means that when you have passion for God, you're willing to get rid of anything in your life just because of that passion. When you have passion for God, you're willing to do anything, go anywhere, reach anyone for the name of the Lord. You're willing to forget yourself, sacrifice self, sacrifice material things, sacrifice your personal private interests, and then... In the pursuit of God, self-sacrificing passion for God. Number two, soul-saving compassion for the lost. Soul-saving compassion for the lost. And the compassion we're talking about is not just sentiment. It's not just emotion. It's not just feeling. It is a kind of compassion that sets your feet in motion. That sets your voice speaking and talking. That makes you to run out to the people. It is compassion that makes you to seek the lost. 
and seek the sinners and preach the truth unto them. That makes you to abandon your convenience, your comfort zone, and then reach out to the people, even though it might entail a lot of challenges and difficulties, trials and pressures. Still, a soul saving compassion for the lost. Number three, scriptural conversion to the Lord. Scriptural conversion to the Lord. Because of that compassion that you have, and you're reaching out to them, and you're touching their lives, and you're bringing them to the Lord, and then they come under the blood of Jesus Christ that is efficacious to forgive them, to cleanse them, to change and transform their lives. And then we see that evidence of the conversion in their lives. And then now are you happy and grateful to God that your ministry is bearing fruit? Because if there's no change in their lives, where is your ministry? If there's no transformation in their lives, where is, the, where is your ministry? If you're, that's my convert, and it's still you know, lying as he used to lie, and smoking as he used to smoke, and drinking as he used to drink, that's my convert. What's the joy in that? Just bringing the sinner out of the world, and then bringing the sinner into the church, and when in the world and in the church, he's still the same old carnal sinner. There's no fruit in that, but the joy joy you have when you preach the word of God unto them is that their lives are turned around and there's this scriptural conversion from the Lord that you can say I praise the Lord I brought him to the Lord and now things are totally different number one self-sacrificing passion for God number two soul saving compassion for the lost number three scriptural conversion to the Lord I come back to number one number one self-sacrificing passion for God. We're looking at, at that second Corinthians chapter five again. Second Corinthians. I'm reading from chapter five. Verses fourteen and fifteen. Second Corinthians chapter five. Verse fourteen. For the love of Christ constraineth us. And that us means every believer. If you're a real child of God, this love of Christ will constrain you. This love of Christ will compel you. This love of Christ will stir you up. This love of Christ will not allow you to rest. You're always thinking, what can I do to repay the love that he has shown to me? What can I do to exercise some effort in making sure I'm reaching out to the people that Jesus died for? Somebody reached me. I must reach another person. Somebody touched my life. I must touch the life of another person. Somebody was not selfish. He was unselfish. He forgot himself so that he can bring the gospel in his saving power unto me. Somebody left his convenience and left every other thing and came to talk to me. That love of Christ now constrains me. And it says in that verse 14 that if one dies... Then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. That's the consequence of that love, that now the love you have for God, this compelling love, constraining love, that now because Christ has died for you, now you are not living for yourself anymore. He didn't live for himself. He didn't die for himself. It wasn't that he needed salvation. He was perfect. He's God in flesh. And because he loved us, that's why he has come down from glory. And he went to the cross, the cross of Calvary. And then he went through all that on your behalf, on my behalf. And he said, because of that love, I abandoned everything selfish, everything personal, everything self-centered. What I want to do now is to show that I'm not going to live unto myself, but unto him that died for me. Unto them, unto him that died for them. That kind of love, and let's see that love expressed in Romans chapter, chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Verse 6. In Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when we are yet without strength, Christ, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. It says, there was nothing good in you, nothing good in any one of us. 
And yet, it was so ungodly, unrighteous, unholy, reprobate, that Christ died for us. Such love, unmerited. Such favor, unmerited. Such grace, unmerited, that He showed us. Have you sometimes looked at your life if the Lord had left you where He found you? Have you sometimes looked at your life when you are just like unreachable, untouchable, unlovable, and yet it was in that situation of being unreachable, unlovable, and untouchable that Jesus Christ died for you? It was when no man will even regard you as anybody, as anything, because your life was so bad, a self centered sinner. A self-willed sinner That even people Even human beings They are looking at you And they are saying This man I don't want to have anything to do with him This woman I don't want anything to do with her And it was at that time Jesus Christ saw you In that pitiable condition In that sinful condition In that abandoned condition Then he died for you It's telling you then How grateful you ought to be That even when you are in your worst state he still loved you. And then you're saying, oh Lord, that you could love me so much at such a time. And then now, and even you are calling me and stuffing my life, filling my life with your grace and strength and power. I want to do everything I can do so that I will repay that love in a little measure. It tells us in verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's a lot in that verse. Number one is to tell the sinners not to think, I need to become better before I get saved. No, you can be saved right now. Where well, we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. And is telling us this, the love of God commended unto us. In that while we well, were yet sinners, ungodly, unrighteous, and evil, it's at that time Christ died. It's also telling the believers, don't reject anyone. Don't abandon anyone. Don't say they are too bad. And don't say they are too evil. They will never come. It's when they were yet sinners. Don't tell them. They must turn over a new leaf before the Lord can take them. Much more than in verse 9, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. Being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It tells us in verse 11, not not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. It tells us that's what God, that's what Christ has done, what God has done in Christ. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9, such great love. See the height of what he has done for us, and see the depth of what he has given unto us. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Stop there for a moment. But we see Jesus, you need to understand this is the eternal one, is the everlasting God. Jesus Christ is being from the beginning. The beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then he was above the angels because he, he claimed equality with the Heavenly Father, with the Almighty God. And yet for your redemption, for my redemption, for salvation, for my salvation, he became a man. He was born in a manger. And then we were told he was made a little lower than the angels. The one who had been above the angels, he lost his position. I should say he gave up his position. He gave up his authority. He gave up everything that he had. So that he could come as man into this world and then redeem you and redeem me from sin. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor for that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man that's what he did he tasted death for you and he tasted death for me and he tasted death for everyone the death of the cross of Calvary is not an ordinary death a peaceful death a sudden death it was an excruciating kind of death, a painful death, agonizing death. You know the story. 
How Judas has come betrayed him. You know the story. How they came with clubs and staves and swords in their hands. And when he saw them, he said, What are you coming for? Who are you coming for? Are you come to the Son of Man? He healed them. He multiplied the bread. And they, they were all fed. They even wanted to make him a king at a particular time. These were the people at the previous weeks that shouted, Hosanna. And now they came and they said, Crucify him. And then Pilate said, What he will have seen done? They said, We don't want to know about that. Crucify him. And then uh, they even fell to the ground when he came to arrest him. And he said, I told you, If you are looking for me, I am he. And then they put a son of crown, a crown of thorns on his head. And they beat him after putting that son of a crown of thorns. They beat him on the head. You know, that kind of pain. Imagine it yourself. Visualize it yourself. They took the robe away from him to mock him. And he put a purple, a purple robe upon him. And he said, Hail the king, the mockery, the, the insult, and the abuse. He suffered that for you and for me. And then eventually they took that robe off and they gave him his own, his own clothes. And then they put, uh, they put the cross on him. And he fell down be- beneath the weight of the cross. And then he got to the place that is called Calvary, the place of the skull. And then they crucified him there. And even those thieves, you know, the, the criminals and the sinners, they were casting something in their teeth. That's what the Bible says. That's making jest of him. Until one of them said, why are we talking like that? Because we know this man has done nothing wrong. But we, we suffer for our sin. And then they said, remember me when you come to a kingdom. And even then in the midst of that agony, he said today, you'll be with me in paradise. And then eventually he said, I serve. And he gave him God something bitter to drink. And then he said, Father, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you forsaking me? And then he said, he yielded up the ghost. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. All that agony, all the process of suffering, he did that for you. And then he said, he tasted death for every man. What's the consequence? What's going to be the result of that? With all that he did, with the tears in Gethsemane, with the sweat of blood in Gethsemane, and there was the agony and the pain of betrayal, and the crown of sons, what are you going to do in return? And then, with the dying on the cross, all the bodily joints, everything out of joint, and then with the weakness and the thirst and, the, and everything, what are you going to do for that? And then, separation from the Almighty God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He went through all that for you. What are you going to do in return? That's why it says the love of Christ. I look at Calvary, I see love. I look at his agony, I see deep love. I see the cry, the, the suffering of Christ, and I see indescribable love. And it says that love of Christ constrains us that if he died like that for me, then I should die to all these little, little things, all those personal things. If he died for all, then we're all dead. That's why we're told in First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, reading from verse 19. First John chapter 4, verse 19. It says, we love him because he first loved us. And this man had been considered the love of Christ. He said, he loved me. How do you know he loves you? Well, apart from just healing my body, apart from multiplying the bread, apart from calming the stormy waters of my life, apart from giving me the gift of faith, apart from giving me a point to go and talk to other people and be a blessing to them, look at Calvary. Calvary alone is enough. What he did on Calvary, the blood he shed, he became the Paschal Lamb, he became the final sacrifice. And because of that, we love him because he forced loved us. The love of Christ constrains us. The implication of that is in Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14 I'm reading to you from verse 7. Romans chapter 14 verse 7 For none of us liveth unto himself. That's the consequence. None of us liveth unto himself. Because of he live unto himself to enjoy his life, the King of glory, the King of kings, the Lord of laws. He did not live unto himself. Because of that, he says, none of us now should live unto himself. Don't you think about yourself anymore. Always think about Christ. See what he did for me. 
and see all the lanes he went for me. And because of everything he's done for me, I'm not thinking about myself anymore. None of us, none of us, young or old, a man or a woman, a worker or a member, you know, sometimes I have some, I have some people reason, and it's a pity people reason like that. They don't do anything for God. I'm not a worker. What do you mean? He died for you. He shed his blood for you. I'm not a worker. What do you mean by that? He went through the pain and the agony for you. I'm not a worker. What do you mean by that? Did he do less for you than he did for the workers? Did he suffer less for you than he suffered for the workers? I'm not a worker. What does that mean? None of us, whether worker or member, a man or a woman, illiterate or educated, young or old, none of us liveth unto himself. And then it says, and no man dies unto himself. Whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For through this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be the Lord, both of the dead and of the living. That means it's not your Lord. Even your dead body belongs to him. And your living body belongs to him. Your soul belongs to him because of what he has done for you. I say, Paul the Apostle captured that. And then he realized that. He said, now for the rest of my life. Here is the way. I'm going to show. I'm going to reveal that I understand Calvary. That I appreciate Calvary. What the Lord has done for me. That I'm not going to live to myself anymore. That's why I said in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I'm looking at you from verse 7. Philippians chapter 3 verse 7. But what things were gained to me? Those I counted loss for Christ. I've been looking at Calvary and I don't appreciate any other thing in my life anymore. I've given them up. I've been looking at the agony of the, of the cross. I'm, I've been looking at the pain that Jesus bore on the cross of Calvary. And the more I think about Calvary, and the more I stay at Calvary, and the more I gaze at Jesus Christ, what he did for me on the cross of Calvary. Now, what things were gained to me, I've counted them lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. When you look at Calvary, that's the conclusion you come to. When you think about Calvary, that's the conclusion you come to. When you think about the salvation he has given you, the love that he manifested for you, that is the conclusion you come to. That now I've counted all things, all things, good things, wonderful things, my position. Among the Sanhedrin, my privilege in the Jewish religion, all those things have now counted for laws uh, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he said, For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dog, that I may win Christ. And let me show you an illustration from the Old Testament. This love of Christ constraining us. The passion for God that that ought to engender, it ought to create, it ought to produce in your life. In uh, first, in, in um, first Kings chapter twenty, first Kings chapter twenty, I'm looking at it from verse uh, from verse one. First Kings chapter twenty verse one. And Benhadad the king of Syria gathered all his hosts together. And there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. Ben Hadad, with all those thirty two kings, came and warred against Midwall, against Samaria. And he sent messengers to Ahab, the king of Israel, into the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Ben Hadad. Before I go, let me explain to you. The life of Ahab was in jeopardy. He was about to lose his life. Because uh, all these uh, 32 kings in confederacy with ben Hadad, they came together. And they were looking for just one man, Ahab. They kill him. They will destroy him. And they will wipe out his army. He lose everything. 
And then Ben Hadad said, Ahab, let me tell you something. We can make a deal. I shall kill you. And look at my army. I just wipe you out. You are dead. But here is the deal. I'll save you alive. I'll show, some love, I'll show some love to you. I will spare you. I'll not kill you. But if I don't kill you, here is the consequence. Here is the deal. Look at it now in verse 3. Thy silver and thy gold is mine. Ahab, do you understand? If you are dead, the gold and the silver, you leave it behind. It will not be useful to you. Now, if I spare your life and you remain alive, your gold and your silver will be mine. Thy wives also and thy children, even the goodliest are mine. If I kill you, would you be enjoying, you know, having a wife in the grave? Now, I'm going to spare your life. But the deal is, when I spare your life, your wives, your children are mine. And then the king of Israel had answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy sin, I am thine and all that I have. If you kill me, will I have any life to live? If you kill me and you destroy me with all these 32 kings around, what will I do with my life? I'm gone. All right, if you spare me and I remain alive, then I belong to you and all that I have. The application is this. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. It shall die. We should have died. Not only the death, that a physical, spiritual death, eternal death. And then we should not, we should not have anything at all. What will a wife do to you? What will husband do to you? What will children do to you when you are in hellfire? What enjoyment would you have with money, with material things? If you are dead, the second death. But Jesus said, I'm not willing that you will die. I will spare your life. I will take that death on your behalf. I will die for you. I love you so much. I do not want you to die. I will make you live. I will bear your punishment. I will bear everything, the consequence of everything you have done. And then he says, but this is the consequence. The love of Christ that died for us now compels me and constrains me that since I should have died, since I should have gone to hell, and he's, he's sparing me, he's not allowing me to go to hell. He now demands that my heart, my life, my talent, my time, everything I have now belongs to him. And then you reply and you say, oh Lord, my king, not been hardened now, but Jesus Christ who died for you, to spare you, to keep you alive. That Jesus Christ, who has given himself to you, my Lord, O King, according to thy word, I am thine. And all that I have, that's the passion for God that we ought to have. Let me show you another illustration. We're looking at Numbers chapter 8. Numbers chapter 8. And I'm reading to you. Before I read, let me explain to you. The children of Israel were in Egypt. And then the last plague came. That last pig was to claim their lives, the lives of the firstborn in Israel. But God said, because of my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I will not allow you to die. Therefore, you will take a lamb, an animal, and you will shed its blood. And you apply the blood upon the lintels of the houses, so you will not die. And this night, the angel of death will pass through the land. And then it so happened, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, to the firstborn of the slaves of the servants in Egypt, to the firstborn of all the animals, all, all of them died in one night. When the children of Israel woke up the following morning, then they were alive. None of them died. And then they came out, they got the, the angel of death passed over them. And then God said, because of that, all the firstborn in Israel, they should have died anyhow, anyway. But now they didn't die because of my love, because of my mercy, because of my covenant. Now all the firstborn will belong to me. Nobody will argue with that. That's the right thing. That's a good bargain. That's a good arrangement. They should have all died, all those firstborn. Where are the firstborns in Egypt of Pharaoh? 
of all his officers. Where are they? They are all gone. They are all dead. Are you firstborn? You still remain alive. You belong to me. Everybody said yes, but something happened. That Moses went to take the law from the hand of the Lord on Mount Sinai. Before he came back, they were all backsliding. Firstborn, secondborn, everybody. And then when Moses came back, he said, Watch, what have you done? You have committed a great sin. And then he went back to God. Before he went back to God, he said, Now, who is on the Lord's side? Let them come unto me. And then the children of Levi, the Levites, they all came. They looked at one another. This is a second chance. The first chance, the whole of the nation missed it. And the Lord is not, because the Lord said, Moses, leave me alone. I will kill all of them. Not only the firstborn now. All the tribes of Reuben and Simeon and Judah and Naphtali and Asher. Everybody. I'm going to kill everybody. Because now they must die. The soul that sinned, they shall die. And Moses said, God, don't do this. If you do this, we escape the death of the firstborn. Now is the death of the whole nation. All right? He said, now, you people see what you've done. And see the consequence of what you have done. Who is on the Lord's side? And the Levites all came out. We're sorry for what has happened. We repent, we turn. And he gave themselves to them. And then God said, Moses, I'm going to make an exchange. Instead of the firstborn belonging to me, I claim the Levites. And these Levites now, because they wanted to escape the final judgment and death, and I make them to escape death. Now I claim them for myself. He's saying the love of God now constrains us. Now you look at Numbers chapter 8. In Numbers chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 5. Numbers chapter 8, verse 5. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them. Those Levites that surrender their lives, that give their lives, and making them to replace the firstborn. And they're going to escape judgment. And then it says in verse, in verse 10, and thou shalt bring the Levites before the Lord, and the children of Israel shall put their hands upon the Levites. And Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord for an offering of the children of Israel, that they may execute the service of the Lord. It says you'll offer them. You'll not kill them, but you offer them. They belong to the Lord now completely. Why? Oh, because they have escaped death. And because they not surrender themselves, they appreciated the love that God had for them. In verse 14, Thus shalt thou separate the Levites from among the children of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine. The Levites shall be mine. Just because you have escaped death. And the Lord is saying, I've saved you. I've ransomed you. I've reconciled you unto myself by the death of Christ. I've shown these uh, great love to you. Now you will be mine. It tells us in verse 16, for they are wholly given unto me from among the children of Israel. Instead of such as open every womb and, and then Yes, even instead of the firstborn of all the children of Israel, I have taken them unto me. Now that you have escaped death because of what Christ has done for you, he says he has taken the Levites just like he said, he has taken you unto himself. In verse 19, I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron. I have taken the Levites, have given them as a gift unto Aaron and to his sons from among the children of Israel to do the service of the children of Israel in the tabernacle of the congregation and to make atonement for the children of Israel. And that means that um, Aaron will not be appealing to any Levites and say, won't you serve the Lord? Already I have given the Levites as a gift unto Aaron. Pick any of them, anytime. Whatever needs to be done in the sanctuary, in the temple, in the tabernacle, pick any of them. I've given all the Levites as a gift. You know, if you really understand Calvary, will not be pushing you and will not be begging you and pleading with you. Won't you serve the Lord? 
Won't you give something to the Lord? If you understood Calvary, if you understood the love, the love that bought you, the grace that sought you, and if you understood the blood that washed you, nobody will be pleading with you. Won't you serve the Lord? I have given the Levites as a gift unto Aaron. And then he tells us in verse 21, the Levites were purified and they washed their clothes and Aaron offered them as an offering before the Lord. That is, he surrendered them unto the Lord. And then it says, Aaron made an atonement for them to cleanse them. Now, if you're a real child of God, you're like those Levites. You realize the love of God. You realize the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. And now you say, I belong to the Lord. Nobody is begging me anymore, pleading with me anymore, that I must do something. The love of Christ constrains you that now you want to serve the Lord. And the one we have to plead and beseech and all that is just an extra effort to make you stand up and get up to do what you ought to have started doing long ago. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, it is once, I want to wake them up. I beseech you therefore, brethren, I beseech you, I'm begging you now. We shouldn't be begging you. Nobody beseeched Paul. Nobody begged Paul. Nobody tried to encourage Paul. He just realized, I was a blasphemer. Can you think about that and God forgive me, I'm going to serve the Lord. I was an injurious person and God has forgiven me the love to forgive an injurious person, a murderer, a wicked man, the chief of sinners. Think about it. Does anybody need to beg me? I'm going to serve the Lord. But this was, they didn't understand the love of Calvary. The love at Calvary, the love of the cross. And because of that, I said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present yourselves, your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, we will serve the Lord. I said we will serve the Lord. Hey, don't, don't wait for somebody to come and beg you. Just, just come. Just come. And say now I realize the love of Christ flowing from Calvary for me. What can I do? What can I do? What you can do is this point number two. Soul saving compassion for the lost. Soul saving compassion for the lost. In Second Corinthians I'm reading from chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18. And all things of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given unto us and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. You say, what can I do for you? What can I do for God? He has given you now the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19 to wit, that is to say that God was in Christ reconciling the world not imputing their trespasses unto them and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation that's what he has committed into our hands not to condemn the sinners not to crucify the sinners Christ has been crucified on our behalf, on our behalf. and therefore what we have now is the word of reconciliation pleading with them Teaching them and exhorting them. Be ye reconciled unto God. In verse 20, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled unto God. We need to have that compassion. Reaching out to them, running after them, pleading with them, calling them to come to know the Lord. In Jude, I'm reading from verse 21. Jude verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some, have compassion. On some, the people outside there have compassion. On some of them. What does that mean? On some, I thought we were to reach everybody. Yes, we are to reach everybody. But you know that you cannot reach everybody. But the whole church will reach everybody. On some, have compassion. You know, there are some people that are, they are so philosophic that if you go to them, you cannot reach them. Leave them for the rest of us who can reason with them in their philosophy. There are some people that, you know, they are so polluted and they are very, very much down in the pit of sin. 
that if you try to go to them, you yourself, you just came out of sin, of the pitch yourself. If you try to go to them, they will pull you back. You don't have the strength, the knowledge, the wisdom to be able to reach them. Leave them for some of us. We can reach them. But the ones you can reach, the ones who have not gone too far, the one who will not reason you out of your after your own experience the one that will not raise you out of your own stability and steadfastness go and reach them on some have compassion in verse 23 on others and others say with fear pulling them out of the fire hitching even the garment spotted by the flesh he's saying that uh, be very careful while you're reaching them because uh, you don't want them to pull you back into, into the pit out of which you came but all the same still have compassion on them and still reach out to them. But if you find that they are proving tough and they want to draw you back, then you say, okay, please, I'll, I'll get you another person. You know, there are some you cannot reach. There are some you cannot talk to. Uh, but leave them for those who can reach them. And then when, if you do your part and I do my part and we all do our parts, we'll reach every one of them in Jesus' name. Compassion, compassion. Get them rescued. In Exodus chapter 2, Exodus chapter 2, you will have this compassion. You will rescue somebody. Exodus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 5. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 5, and the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens watched along the river the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept, and she had compassion on him, and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. The story here is about Moses, when he was a little baby. And this little baby was, uh, the mother hid the little baby for about three months, and then could not have the child again, and put that child in this basket, and then by the riverside, to see what will happen to the child. And Miriam, the sister, was standing nearby, and eventually when the daughter of Pharaoh got there, he said, what is that? And then took uh, that basket and opened it, and it was this baby Moses, and baby Moses cried, and she had compassion on him. Him, compassion and rescued him out of the watery grave out of that water that could have meant death for him and then Miriam immediately came shall I go and find a nurse for you to nurse the baby and then the daughter of Pharaoh said yes that's how Moses got back home to the mother and eventually that's how Moses was raised up and that's what great deliverer who knows the deliverer you are going to bring to the Lord who knows if you are going to be instrumental to the conversion of another Moses a Paul, a Daniel, a son Samuel, who knows if you reach out to them and you have compassion on them and not allow them to die. And that's what the uh, daughter of Pharaoh did, will not allow Moses to die in that watery grave, having compassion upon him. That's how Moses was saved. That's how he became a savior, a deliverer, even to the whole nation. God will help you. Jeremiah chapter 12. In Jeremiah chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 12, reading from verse 14. Here it tells us, thus says the Lord against all my evil neighbors that touch the inheritance, that touch, uh, chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 14, thus says the Lord against all my evil neighbors that touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit. Behold, I will pluck them out of their land and pluck out the house of Judah from among them. And it shall come to pass after, after that I have plucked them out, I will return and have compassion on them and I will bring them again every man to his heritage and every man to his land. That's the compassion. I will bring them again, every man to his heritage. The Lord is saying, bring the people back to their heritage, to their creator. Bring the people back to their source of life. Bring the people back to the Christ who died for them. We can do it. And we're going to do it. Everybody in the church did it in the early church in Acts of the Apostles chapter 8 verse 4. Acts chapter 8 verse 4. Here is what it says. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. They. 
that was scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And everywhere you go, she'll be preaching the word. There shall be tracks in your bag, tracks in your pocket. You're giving out every time. There should be the word of reconciliation in your mouth that you're declaring to everyone when you go to the market, when you're in a taxi, when you're in a bus, when you're in, when you're in the office, anywhere you are, anywhere you find yourself, a student in school, anywhere you find yourself, when you have contact with human beings, you go everywhere preaching the word. If you will do that, you'll bring a lot of souls into the kingdom of God. Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, I'm reading to you there from verse 14. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So, as much as in me is, I am ready. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? Uh, Paul the Apostle said, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are from also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, when we've gone out like that in faithfulness, and we allow the love of God to compel us, to constrain us, to show this love and preach the word of reconciliation, a mystery of reconciliation to the people around us. What's the effect? What's the fruit? What's the impact on the world around us? Scriptural conversion to the Lord. Scriptural conversion to the Lord. Uh, that brings us to Second Corinthians again, chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're looking at verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Paul the Apostle was saying, I've come to you at Corinth, and I've preached the word of God to you. And if my ministry has borne any fruit in your life, we should be new creatures. I've come to you in Philippi, and I've preached the word of God unto you. If my ministry has brought any fruit in Philippi, you should be new creatures by now. You Thessalonians have been to you, Bereans have been to you. And if my ministry has brought any fruit in your life, you should be new creatures by now. And you people of Galatia, of Galatia, because I've not seen the fruit, I'm traveling in birth for you again until Christ be formed in you. What I'm looking for is the evidence of Christ in you. If any man be in Christ, a new creature. And then he tells us, he says, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's what we should be looking for. In the people we preach to, the change, the transformation, the conversion, the newness of life. If you have not seen that, then you keep on traveling for them, praying for them and preaching to them. Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 3. Acts chapter 15, verse 3. What brought joy in the early church is the conversion, is the transformation, is the change of life, becoming new creatures in Christ. Acts chapter 15, verse 3. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. Declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. Declaring, telling them, showing them something has happened. Among the Gentiles, their conversion. They're no more worshipping idols. They're no more doing evil. They're no more killing one another. They're no more hating one another. And they're no more taking the wives of one another. There's conversion because of going to the Gentiles. And it says, the conclusion is in verse 3, they cause great joy unto all the brethren. They cause great joy unto all the brethren. Uh, even Paul himself, look at the testimony of his life. Galatians chapter 1. This is what brought joy among other people when they saw the life, the changed life of Paul himself. In Galatians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 15. But when he pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Immediately I was not dilly dallying. I was not wasting time. I was not uh, thinking it over. Should I or should I not? 
I just said immediately and to respond. And then he tells us in verse 22, And I was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which he was destroyed. That's conversion. That's a change of life. That's a change of direction. That's a change within his own life. Because he was persecuting before, but now he preaches the faith which he once destroyed. And he glorified God in me. That's the, that's the change we ought to see. That what you were doing before, you are no more doing it. That's what brings joy in the heart. Of any soul winner in the heart of any believer, and when you see, if you see, if your brother says, "Now I'm born again," now you want to see the change. If your own junior sister, senior sister said, "Do you know somebody preach to me? I'm born again now." You'll not be happy if you don't see any change. If you know, she, if he, she was, uh, you know, of the world before, totally of the world, and it's still the same. You say, "Well." I'm glad somebody prayed to you, but I'm still waiting to see the effect and the influence of that, the impact of that preaching. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only. If there's no conversion, that's word only. That's preaching only. That's superficial. Our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power in, and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as sweet as you know what manner of men were among you for your sake. It says our gospel came to you and it had an impact, a great, great influence on you. And you became followers of us. And you became followers of us. And you became followers of us. When our converts are followers of us, that's what brings joy. But if our followers are follow, if our converts are followers of them, we're preaching to them, but they're not following our example. They're not reading the Bible like we read the Bible. They don't love to come to Bible study as we love to come to the Bible study. There's no joy. If they're followers of us, they will want to be what we are. And they will want to do what we do. And they will love the fellowship of the children of God. He became followers of us and of the Lord. Of the Lord, following the Lord, all the teachings of the Word of God, having received the Word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the Word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God's Word is spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. Everybody was talking about them. So and so has changed. So and so has turned around. So and so is no more doing what he used to do. And that's what brings joy. He's not going to the nightclub again. She's not a prostitute anymore. A new change, a new transformation has come upon her. It's not a, you know, abusive like he used to be abusive. It's not a quarrelsome like he used to do. It says in verse, in verse 9, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering we had unto you. How ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. The change, the transformation was the evidence they were now delivered from the wrath to come. And sometimes it's like somebody has been has known the Lord before, either in this church or in another church. But as you preach to the fellow, who oh, says, I used to understand that. I used to follow that myself. I used to even be in a gospel church, in a Pentecostal church. But now, I'm no more in that kind of a religion. What happened to you? Well, I just lost interest because this happened. This happened in our church and then I became frustrated. I, I just left. I, I don't want to go to any church anymore. And then you keep on preaching to them, preaching to them. And then they say, okay, from what you are saying now, looks like I need to come back to the Lord. When that change takes place, that's conversion. James chapter 5. James chapter 5 verse 19. Brethren, if any of you do hear from the truth and one convert him. If any of you hear from the truth and one 
convert him. The implication is this. The fellow was in the truth before. He was in Christ before. But he erred from the truth. He went astray from the truth. And then you go to him. You are not telling him just, just to come back. Come back to the church. That's not enough. You're not telling him, you know, be as you are. You know, the fellow now is just looking at him, is, is carrying the world on his head. And he's carrying the world on his shoulder. And he's wrapped all around of the world. And he's wearing the world. And you can see that this fellow, although he was in the gospel before, but now the world is inside and outside. Around and within, if any of you do see, you see any brother that errs from the truth and won't convert him. The conversion means that the world around him, on his head, in his uh, appearance, everything will now change in his life, in his imagination, in his thought, in his planning. Everything will now change. If any of you do hear from the truth and won't convert him, or maybe it's a lady, and the lady used to be a real child of God. And looking at her in years gone by, you know, very prayerful, very solemn, very humble, very dedicated. Even the appearance will show the quietness, the humility, and the submission to the word of God. The obedience to the word of God. And she was, uh, she was a kind of joy to the membership of the church, a kind of joy to the, you know, to, uh, to the leadership in the church. But maybe it was at the time of marriage. You know, this one, uh, I thought is the will of God, but the fellow said, no, this other one. What am I going to stay like this? And then she went back into the world to go and marry whatever. And just said, I'm going to settle this marriage. Whatever will come, let it come. And now she's married, but she's not happy in that marriage. Although there are children, but uh, there's no peace at home. And then she's just wandering about. She, she goes to this church and this church and that church. And she will not really come to the place where she had a foundation on her root. She's thinking, it will be too much shame for me to come back. And then you, you confronted her. But by the time you got to her, the world is in the ears. The world is in the nose. And the world is on the head. And the world is, you know, like a wrapper around her. And say, well, come. You can still come back. Will Jesus take me the way I am? Yes, he will take you and cleanse you. If any of you, if you see anyone that, is heard from, that has heard from the truth, and one convert him, that's the conversion. And then she goes on her knees again and said, Lord, I am sorry. All this world I brought on myself, in my ear, on my nose, in my mouth, on my leaves, on my head, like a wrapper around me. I wrap myself with the word. Oh Lord, I repent. I give up. My thoughts, my mind, my imagination, my lifestyle. Lord, I give everything up. And then the Lord cleanses her again with the blood of the Lamb. And now she's changed. She has become a new creature in Christ. If any lady, if any woman be in Christ, a new creature, all things have passed away. All all things have become new. She comes out of that prayer room, out of that counseling room, and everything is totally changed. The humility has come back, and the submissiveness has come back. And then she surrenders to the Lord again and says, So, Lord, this time I'll never go back again. I'll never go back to the world. Any time that there's any tendency for me to go back to the world, take me out of this world and take me to heaven. That's conversion. That's conversion. That's why it says, If any of you, if you do see any anyone that erred from the truth, that has gone away from the truth, it says in that verse 19, and won't convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the air of his way shall save his soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. What a glorious ministry the Lord has given to us. And we're going to be useful in this ministry in Jesus' name. And as we bring other people to the Lord, the Lord will reward you. And the Lord will bless the work of your hands. But if you're going to bring anybody to the Lord, you yourself must be in the Lord. If you're going to bring anybody out of the well, you must be out of the well yourself. That's why we're reading Psalm 51. Psalm 51, I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multi of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Here is David. David knew the Lord. As the Swiss psalmist of Israel. David knew the Lord. He was a real child of God. But you know what he did? 
at the time of temptation, he surrendered his life, his body, his soul into immorality. Wash me thoroughly, he began to pray for my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desired truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me. He began to pray. He said, I need cleansing myself. I cannot go out now and talk to other people. I cannot go out and tell other people to change. I need to change myself. I need a transformation myself. I need a cleansing myself. Purge me and with Aesop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a new heart, O God. Renew in me a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of salvation. I have sorrow for sin, I have backsliding, I have gone away from the Lord. Now restore to me the joy of thy salvation. And, t- and then he says, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then not bust a He said, do this for me first. Cleanse me first. Purge me first. Turn me around first. Let the evidence of salvation come back to me. And the joy of salvation, let it come back to me. Then, in verse 13, when I teach transgressors thy ways. When I'm alright myself, then I'll reach out to other people. When I have the joy of salvation restored unto me, then I'll be able to reach other people. Then, when I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. You will convert sinners to the Lord. You will turn many souls to righteousness. And great will be your reward here on earth and in heaven in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up and make a commitment to yourself to the Lord. The love of the Lord is constraining us. The love of the Lord is challenging us. The love of the Lord is saying, look at what Christ has done for you. What are you going to do for the Lord? What are you going to do for the Lord? See what the Lord has done for you. And see how far, how great, how high, how deep the love of Christ for you. And because of that love of Christ for you, what will you do? What will you do? Won't you say, Lord, I come, I give myself to you. He has given himself for you to cleanse you, to purge you, to transform you, to change your life. To write your name in the book of life. And to make you a new creature in Christ. And to put newness of life into you. Newness of heart. He has taken your condemnation away. What are you going to do for God? He has taken your judgment away. What are you going to do for the Lord? He has cleansed you. He has washed you. He has purchased you. He has redeemed you. What are you going to do for the kingdom? You should have died. The death penalty was upon you. You should have died. The soul that sinned it shall die. But the gift of God is life eternal. Now he has given you eternal life instead of the death that you married. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? For the Lord as a result of what he has done for you. The love of Christ constrains us. Have you beheld the Lamb of God? On the cross of Calvary? Have you tasted of the grace of the goodness of God flowing from Calvary? Does the Spirit of God bear witness with your heart that you're a real child of God? Then, do something. You love Him because He first loved you. You want to rescue others because God used others to rescue you. Because he has forgiven you. You want to be an instrument of forgiveness for other people. You've got the gospel. You have enjoyed the gospel. You have benefited from the gospel. 
you have received the gospel the gospel has done something for you so great it has opened your eyes it has taken your darkness away now the light of the gospel is shining shining you and shining through you you must do something don't say i'm not a worker didn't christ die for you don't say nobody has given me a work to do didn't you benefit from the cross of calvary Somebody told you, tell somebody else. Somebody showed you the way. Show somebody else the way. Somebody became instrumental to your salvation. Be an instrument of salvation. Regeneration for other people. Selfishness is a sin. If you are keeping the gospel to yourself without sharing it, that's selfishness damnable selfishness self-centeredness is a sin it's a great sin tell other people don't let them condemn you in eternity you knew so much truth of the gospel of salvation didn't tell me that's wickedness tell them tell them of christ to that for them Tell them of Christ who died on the cross of Calvary. Tell them of Christ who shed his blood for the cleansing of all sinners. Tell them, show them, show them. Don't let them die. You see them day by day. You sit down with them. You go by their side. You take the bus with them. You live with them. Tell them. Are they your friends? Tell them. co tenants tell them co-workers tell them your relatives tell them how can you just be laughing with a sinner just talking on business with a sinner and they are right at the brink of hell do something do something whatever you can do whatever you can do the word is in your mouth the message is in your mouth. Do use all the methods you can use. You need to write a letter to them. Write it. You need to send them a text on the phone. Do it. You need to pick up your pen or pick up your phone and make them to know the way of salvation. Do it immediately. You want to use other means? Use your brain, use your mind, use your talent, use your money. Do everything you can do. You can do something. You can be an instrument to the salvation of one, of two, of ten, of a hundred, of a thousand, of many people within your country, even outside your country. Whatever God has put in your hand. Whatever ability the Lord has given you to send the message, the word of salvation unto a lost world, do it. Have mercy on them, have compassion on them. Don't let your neighbors perish in their sin. Don't let narrow self your way debar. Don't let selfishness, self-centeredness hinder you from taking the gospel to the people around you. Don't let personal, private, selfish, self-centered consideration hinder you from taking the gospel to the people who are waiting Rise up and do something. Stand in the gospel and then share the gospel. Live in the gospel and preach the gospel. Let others see Christ in you and assure them they can have Christ in them too. Everywhere you go, preach the gospel. Wherever you live, preach the gospel. 
wherever you work, preach the gospel. Wherever you interact with, preach the gospel. Whatever the circumstance, preach the gospel. Whatever the method or the approach, preach the gospel. Whoever the person may be, preach the gospel. Tell them they won't die in their sin. Was you just looking on? Preach the gospel. Make a commitment of your life, a commitment of your resources, a commitment of what you have unto the Lord that you will preach the gospel. Preach it for the life you live. Preach it with your pattern of behavior. Preach it with the light shining through you. Preach it with the commitment of an ambassador of Christ. Preach it with your eyes, your face focused on eternity. Preach it knowing this is the most important thing. That have been committed into your hand. Preach it. In season and out of season. Preach it to your friends. Preach it to your enemies. Preach it to the careless. And preach it to the religious. Reach everyone. Touch everyone. Take the gospel of salvation. Everywhere you go. Don't let the people die. In their sins. You see your mouth. Don't give your mouth to any other thing. Useless conversations that will not have any reward in eternity. Don't give your life to useless things that will not contribute to the salvation of souls. Don't give your effort to anything that will not help people to see the light of the gospel. Commit everything you have. Commit your time. Commit your skill. Commit your energy. Commit your effort. Commit your service to saving souls. The souls in the church you can reach. The souls outside the church you must reach. They're everywhere. Share the gospel with somebody today. Share the gospel with somebody every day. Lead them to decision. Lead them to a decision. Decision to know the Lord. Decision to love the Lord. Decision to give their hearts, their lives, the present and the future to the Lord. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 